So in this portion of the GWAS lecture, we're going to review the basics of GWAS and then understand some of the potential clinical impacts that GWAS um, can have. And so we use GWAS to point us towards genes involved in disease. And GWAS stands for Genome-Wide Association Study. And so in order for it to be genome-wide, we have to compare the genome sequences of individuals who have a disease or the cases to genome sequences of individuals who do not have the disease or controls. And we take those genome sequences of these two groups and we compare them to each other. And then we're able to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms or differences between individuals who have the disease and individuals who don't. And this sort of implies that there might be something going on at the location of this single nucleotide polymorphism that's leading to disease. And so once we know which SNPs are more common in the case group over the control group, we can actually visualize that on a plot like this, Manhattan plot down here. You can see individual chromosomes, 1 through 22, from left to right, and you can see SNPs that are increased in the cases versus the controls as coming up vertically off of this um, x-axis, and the higher those dots go, the more SNPs are found at that particular location in the genome. And so here we can see there are a lot of SNPs found here on this chromosome 6, a lot of SNPs found here on chromosome 12, and a lot here on chromosome 19. And these would be SNPs that are found in the cases group, um, but not the control group. And that would suggest that there's some variation in the people who have the disease at these locations. And we can start to look at these particular genetic locations on these areas of the chromosome 6, 12, and 19 to look for genes that might be involved in disease, right? And so once again, GWAS can't identify a specific gene that's involved in disease. But what it can do is tell us where to start looking. In this case, we would start looking on chromosome 6, chromosome 12, and chromosome 19, because that's where we see the most SNPs associated with the disease group. And so while GWAS on its own cannot tell us exactly which gene is causing disease, it can push us in the right direction. And ultimately, GWAS is sort of the first step in that leads to the isolation and ultimate characterization of genes involved in disease. It points us in the right direction, gives us some good chromosomal locations to start with, and then ultimately we hope that we can find uh, genes in those locations that have an impact on disease. But one other thing that GWAS also does is it gives us new diagnostic markers for genetic disorders. And so we know that a patient usually has a lot of SNPs at a particular genetic location. We can use that SNP as a diagnostic marker to um, assess if someone is predisposo predisposed for a particular disorder. And we could actually use SNPs as sort of a way to diagnose particular disease phenotypes before you even see the disease come on. And so GWAS has helped identify genes um, involved in several different diseases. So there have been genome-wide association studies done on all of these diseases that you see here, arthritis, um, Crohn's disease, different cancers, some um, more complicated illnesses like bipolar disorder, even eating disorders. And from the GWAS studies are comparing people who have these illnesses to the general population or controls who don't, we're able to identify several genes that are involved in these different diseases. You can see more of those diseases over here, other types of arthritis, type 2 diabetes, ulcerative colitis or UC, even autism um, has had one or two genes identified through GWAS. And so one thing that GWAS is great for is understanding diseases that don't just have one genetic cause, but may have multiple genes involved in causing the pathology of that disease. And one disease that falls into this group 
is Alzheimer's disease, particularly late onset Alzheimer's disease. And so most cases of Alzheimer's disease are what we refer to as late onset, meaning they come on later in life or later in adulthood. And we know a lot about um, early onset Alzheimer's disease and some of the genetic components involved in that, but we know very little about this sporadic or late onset Alzheimer's. And so GWAS is a great way to start figuring out what genes might be involved in late onset Alzheimer's. And so we recently, there's a more recent study where over a million genomes were compared, about a million control genomes were compared to almost 100,000 patient genomes who have late onset Alzheimer's disease. And through this study, um, or this GWAS, 38 new loci or new genetic locations were identified, or 38 locations were identified. Seven of them were new, previously unknown. And you can actually see the Manhattan plot from the study here. So everywhere you see these high um, vertical peaks of dots, those are loci or those are locations of SNPs that are different between people who have late onset Alzheimer's and people who don't. And so you can actually see one, two, three, and so on, different locations identified all along the genome, some of which we didn't know before. The ones we were not familiar with um, were genes that are important in both immune response and the function of a particular type of um, glia, which or a support cell in the brain called microglia. So <laughs> there seems to be some link between decreased immunity and decreased particularly neuroimmunity in the brain and development of late onset Alzheimer's. And so now that we know um, some of these new genes and the role of the immune system and its connection to Alzheimer's, people are looking into microglia and the immune response um, and they're able to test and do some research on genes involved in that to hopefully understand this type of Alzheimer's better. Another, another complex illness, um, mental disorder, is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is multigenic. It's not one gene that causes schizophrenia, and so um, a genome-wide association study is great to start understanding all the different possible locations <coughs> that might be involved, or all the possible genes that might be involved in a patient developing schizophrenia. So this is another relatively large uh, GWAS study. You can see there are almost 35,000 people who have schizophrenia, 45,000 people in the general population who don't, and their genomes were compared. And all of these loci you can see above the red line, all of those locations, were identified as possible locations for genes involved in schizophrenia. And so one thing I'd like to point out here is that you can see just by looking at this plot that there are tons of potential locations that might be involved. This one here seems to be the most relevant. It has the largest peak, the most number of SNPs at this location on chromosome six, <coughs> but um, I think that this speaks to one of the reasons why it's so difficult to treat some of the mental disorders, um, particularly schizophrenia, because it's difficult to treat this many potential genetic defects at one time. That's what can lead to such a difference in sy symptoms from patient to patient. Different genes affected, maybe one gene, maybe 10, maybe 20. Maybe one person only has two genes affected versus one has seven, and that can lead to this huge spectrum of symptoms in patients, and it can also lead to a huge spectrum in the effectiveness of treatments. I think that's also important when thinking about autism. Um, there can be many genetic locations implied in autism. GWAS has shown a lot of potential genes involved in the development of that disorder. And we know that that autism disorder is a spectrum disorder, which means it can vary from very mild to very severe. And I think appreciating how many different genes could be involved and how some might be affected and others might not um, helps appreciate why it's so complex 
to understand the disease and also so complex to treat it. Um, one other thing that we have used GWAS for is to point us towards genes that extend longevity. Um, we are always interested in living longer and better. We love the idea of living forever. And so studying longevity or extension of lifespan in humans is one thing that we've been able to do with GWAS. We can compare people who live to an old age, live up to 100, to people um, who are younger, and we can look for SNPs that vary between those old aged individuals and other individuals to see what genes might be implicated in helping them live to that old age. And one of those <clears throat> genes that has been implicated through longevity studies time and time again is this gene here called APOE. You can see that there's SNPs all along this region of individuals who are 90 plus. They happen to have a lot of variation at this particular area, indicating there might be something going on with that APOE gene. So APOE is a gene on chromosome 19, and it encodes a protein called apolipoprotein E. And apolipoprotein E's job is to transport fats and particularly cholesterol within the bloodstream. And there's three different alleles for APOE, or three different forms. You can actually see what all three of those different forms looks like in protein version up here on the top. You have APOE2, APOE3 in the middle, and APOE4 on the right. And generally, <clears throat> from genome-wide association studies, what we found is that APOE2 is the allele that we term as like the good allele. APOE3 is sort of neutral, and APOE4 is the bad allele. And so people who have extended longevity tend to have two copies of the APOE2 allele, whereas people who have decreased longevity tend to have two copies of the APOE4 allele. What's interesting is even having one copy of the APOE4 allele um, and then maybe one E3 or E2 is still enough to decrease longevity a little bit. Um, one thing that is associated with APOE4 alleles as well is an increased risk of developing uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease. And so they think that there's some link between the transportation of fats and lipids, particularly in the brain, um, and that APOE2 is more efficient at transportation of these lipids and fats to the correct location as opposed to APOE4. And so we can actually almost use these APO alleles as a way to predict um, at least a decrease in longevity for those who have two copies of that bad APOE4 allele. Ultimately, these GWAS studies are extremely useful for studying things that don't just have one genetic cause. Things like cancer, um, diabetes, longevity, aging, um, mental disorders like schizophrenia, um, neurological or neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And GWAS is sort of the future of being able to use genomic sequencing and big data analysis to really make strides into understanding the genetics underlying our diseases and how to better treat them and diagnose them before they actually manifest any symptoms.